Good morning, everybody. You are watching the breakout of the Q&A session. This is one of the specific questions that was asked. So if you're looking for the answer to just that question, you can watch just this video. If, on the other hand, you want to watch the entire Q&A session, which has a lot more feedback from the live audience, just click here and you can watch that entire video. Charlie asks, I can't find anything in terms of external flash for my GH5 other than Panasonic's offerings. Do you have any suggestions? And I did get an answer for Charlie. It was the Nissan i40 and I said I'd keep digging and I did and I didn't come up with anything else. So the, the let's start off with the Panasonic flashes just so you see what, what there is there. So I grabbed the two models here. You got the, um, the 580 and the 360. Full model number DMW-FL580L and DMW-FL360L. So bigger, smaller flashes. I'm gonna pop them on the camera here so you can see the size in comparison in just a moment here. But I also, I did bring up um, this the spec sheets on, not spec sheets, but whatever the um, B&H pages on these. So here, this is one that I don't have. And as far as I know, it, there's no reason this wouldn't work. It's a much smaller flash with the little FL200 and the least expensive at 227. Now, look at the guide number. This is an important part. This will give you an idea of the power. So this guy's got a guide number 66 feet at ISO 100. Okay, so 66. Then we go up to the 360, the little one I have in my hands. That gives you a guide number of 118. And then the Panasonic 580 goes up to 190. So there's a big difference there between the power between the 360 and the 580. Now, the one that we we're talking about, this other third party one, is from a company called Nissan. Now, the guide number on the Nissan is 130, so it sits in between these two. So it's a little bit more than the 360 at 118, but it is definitely less than the big 580 at 190. So it does sit somewhere in between. It also sits in between in price, which surprised me. Being a third-party strobe, I thought it would be cheaper, but 249 for that versus 227 for the smaller 360, slightly smaller, so slightly cheaper, slightly smaller, and then uh, half the price of the bigger, uh, the bigger 580 at 190. Uh, at, sorry, at 190 guide number, so $500 flash. So this little guy here, I have never used it myself. Let's let's put that out there. I've never used this one myself, but one of the other Lumix luminaries who shoots weddings does use these, and he's quite pleased with them. He likes these guys. So it is physically smaller flash. It's uh, got, well, obviously less power than the big one, a little bit more than the little one. But I think one of the nice advantages, I think one of the reasons people like these is if we look at the back of this thing, you'll see that it has dials, hardware dials on there to help dial in the amount of power that you want. I will admit that using these, adjusting the, the LED, the interface on here is not great. This is not Lumix strong point here, making these, these flash interfaces is not great. So if you're looking for something simple manual type control, but that does have TTL output, it's worth considering. It does have good reviews. Uh, and like I said, another Lumix Luminary has said that they like it quite a bit. So I think that is worth considering. Um, but given that it is also lower powered, if you want the most powerful flash with TTL, then you're going to be looking at the 580. One of the things that's really important to realize, though, is that this is, when we're talking about compatibility here, it's only about the TTL. That's the fully automatic through the lens uh, exposure, right? So you put the camera on, you basically put an automatic, and as your subject gets closer or farther, whatever, you change lens settings the flash output is always accurate. It is, it is always right. That's TTL. A lot of people, myself included, primarily shoot manual. Now, TTL is a great option if you're doing something like weddings, hence my colleague who's a wedding photographer. It's great for weddings because obviously things are changing all the time, right? You're out shooting the, the reception, the whatever. The things are changing, so you want that automated feature. For me, when I'm shooting strobes, it's almost always either in the studio or in a studio-like setting outdoors where I'm setting up lights, probably multiple lights on light stands with modifiers and so on. And so TTL in that regard, I don't really use. Now that's not to say that it, there isn't a place for it. I know that um, Joe, uh, Joe McNally is a huge fan. He does the Nikon stuff. He does, he's a huge fan of using TTL on the lights. And there's some really awesome things you can do with the lights as far as going on the back of the camera and saying, wirelessly saying, okay, take camera bank A and drop it down a stop and take B up a third of a stop and that sort of thing. Really, really awesome, powerful stuff. Uh, that's just not the way that I typically work. And so if you're working manual, the advantage is that you can use essentially any flash in the world. If the hot shoe is universal. There's a center dot on the hot shoe. That's the one that actually fires the flash. The other four buttons in there are contacts or for doing other things, other communication. But every flash in the world will have that center dot. You can put any flash on here and trigger it and then fire it manually, obviously, and then you can adjust the light as needed. That also means that you could have radio or optical slaves or just wired 
remote lights and have as many lights as you want set up, all being triggered remotely, but again, without the TTL, just manually. So it'd be a dumb light if you want to look at it that way. So you have to set the settings yourself. Again, it just depends on what you're doing. For me, when I'm shooting strobes, it's almost always all manual unless I am doing something like a party. So I don't really, I mean, I have these, these TTL lights, uh, but usually I'm using something like the Pro Photos, like the bigger lights and so on. And of course, those are all manual for this. So there is that. Now I said I'd show you what this looks like on here. Let's start with the smaller one, just so you can get an idea of the size. So there's the little light and I switch over to the remote camera here. So you can see there, it's a small on-camera flash. And it's funny because this is the smaller light, but if you looked at this and you put it next to a picture of a Canon with their big speed light on it, it would look about the same. The proportions look the same because this is a smaller camera. So let's put the full-size light on, which is physically about the same size as the Canon or Nikon equivalent lights. And you can see now it looks quite large on this body, but again, it's just because the body here is smaller than what you might be used to if you're not coming from uh, from the Lumix world. So that's it. That's, that's, I just wanted to show you a little size comparison on there so you can see how this works. So yeah, Nissan i40, that is the only TTL light that I am aware of, that I've been made aware of, that is compatible with the Lumix lineup. But again, if you go full manual, then you can use absolutely anything you want. All right, now let's take a look at the questions that are flying by here, because a couple did. Um, oh, Sully says there is a new flash for the Godox Flashpoint TT3650 for Olympus and Panasonic cam cameras available at Adorama. Ooh. Well, then let's just, uh, let's see, I'm going to pull that up on here. Uh, let's see here, Godox. Yeah, that's right, I forgot about the Godox stuff. But TT3650, 3650. No results, maybe that's a zero. TT3650. There we go. Uh, no, All right, I'm just going to go straight to Adorama because I'm not finding it the other way. Uh, and you also said Flashpoint. Let me just try searching for that. Flashpoint. Let's try Flashpoint Lumix and see if that comes up with it. Nope. That's not it either. You're just making this up, aren't you? You're teasing me now. TT365. 365. Let's just try that without the O or the zero. Nope. See, you're just making stuff up now, aren't you, silly? Godox Lumix. Let's try that. Godox Lumix. That doesn't do anything. I'll try. Nope. Godox Panasonic. All right, now you're just making things up. Throw a link in there for me, please, uh, and I will see if I can find it. Panasonic. Godox Panasonic. Oh, here we go. Got it. TT. Same model you wrote. I don't know why it didn't show up here. Well, that's cheap. Okay, here's, here's the light. The Flashpoint Zoom Mini TTL R2 Flash with integrated R2 radio transceiver. Slick. Olympus and Panasonic compact cameras. It says TTL. It's radio $85. That is cheap. Does it give a guide number rating? Let's see, specs. Guide number 80. So that is a very low powered light. But hey, if you just need a couple of low powered lights, a couple of, I mean, shoot, at that price, a couple of these stacked together, um, that's kind of cool. Right on. Well, excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that, Sully. That is pretty awesome. And Sully says the Nissan sucks in comparison to the Godox system. Well, there you go. Taken live from the chat room, you heard it here first. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully those who have the Nissan don't feel quite that badly about it, but that's good to know. And let's see here. Oh, Silly saying, not sure if if Joseph uses uh, high speed sync. Oh, that's a great point. Okay, high speed sync HSS. It's also called what is it called in in here? It's got a different. They call it something else in here. But anyway, high speed sync. That is another very good reason to use these strobes. So yeah, let me thank you for bringing that up. Um, High speed sync, well, let's start off with regular sync. Regular sync is you put your flash on here and it fires up to a sync speed of maximum, depending on the camera and flash. It might be 125th of a second, it might be 250th of a second. It just depends on whose camera flash you're using. Pretty much every camera manufacturer in the world now that does these type of cameras, and I, by these I mean big interchangeable lens, um, you have something called high speed sync that allows you to sync at a higher shutter speed than that maximum that is normally set up by the regular sync. So with high-speed sync, you can go all the way up to typically eight thousandths of a second or whatever the max mechanical shutter speed is on the camera. Mechanical shutter speed, important note, has to be mechanical, not electronic. Until cameras have global shutters, then we're all mechanical shutter to do strobe. Okay, anyway, side note. High-speed sync allows you to synchronize the flash at a higher shutter speed. The way that it works is instead of 
firing one flash that happens when the shutter opens, it fires a pulse of flash, a series of pulses, faster than the human eye can see, a series of pulses that line up with the slit in the shutter. So here's, I know I've talked about this before, but let's do a quick little recap of it. Let's say this is your shutter, right? Normally, so and it's closed, right? Your shutter's closed. Normally the shutter opens, curtain drops down, the whole uh, sensor is now exposed, the flash fires, bop, and then the shutter closes. Okay, so open, flash fires, closes. Once you get above a certain shutter speed, typically around 250th of a second, the time that it takes for this to close, uh, for this to open all the way and then close again, you can't do that fast enough to get anything faster than 250th of a second. So what happens is this starts to open and then before this closes, the top one starts to close. So you end up with a slit and that's the size of that slit determines effectively the shutter speed. So what happens, will, what will happen is if you go above that 250th of a second, let's say this one's opening and this one starts to close and the flash fires. Now the shutter is covering part of the sensor when the flash fired and you get a black bar. So if you've ever done, gone full manual, been playing with your settings and you go, why am I getting this black bar on my image? That's why. So high speed sync basically fires a pulse of light, boop, 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 a little pulse as that slit exposes the shutter, obviously very meticulously timed so that it can capture light the sensor completely. So pop, 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 pop as it goes down. This is all happening in something like eight thousandths of a second. So it's super, super fast and you can freeze crazy motion. So for that, you do need these. There are third party lights that will do high speed sync that are not TTL. So you just have to look for that. And that would be compatible to a specific camera manufacturer. So that is something else to look at. OK, I hope that answers that. All righty. Um, Trevor Pinnicky says, HSS high-speed sync dramatically reduces the power of a flash and has a similar effect on battery life, but it's a very convenient feature. Okay, I see, yeah, okay, you're, I'm reading it backwards from what you're saying. It reduces the battery life because the flash has to fire multiple times in that fraction of a second. So your battery, you don't get as much power as a single pulse and the battery will die more quickly. So that's one of the reasons you don't use high-speed sync just all the time.